Um, well, thank you for inviting me here uh, to speak about um, World Vegan Day, about my, my vegan journey. Um, I'm not going to evangelise. I'm not going to hit you with statistics and kind of come the heavy handed. You all must go vegan right now. I'm just going to tell you about my life. So uh, it's not going to be that boring, I hope. Um, so I um, went vegan when I was six years old, which was quite a few decades ago, I have to say now. And um, people think that's kind of weird. Um, this was in the early 1970s. Um, did I declare to my mum, I want to go vegan mum? No, I didn't. I didn't even know what the word meant at that time. I just knew the principle. So it wasn't really a decision to go vegan. It was a reaction. I love animals. Everything I do my whole life is centered around helping animals in some way, shape or form. So. Um, not being party or part of any cruelty to them just seemed an obvious thing to me. I, was, I went vegetarian at the uh, age of three, uh, completely self-styled. I will, I will say at this point, um, I don't come from some bohemian family where we traveled around and everything was all right. To let you know what my family background is, my dad was a miner on strike through a lot of the 1970s and 80s, and my mom was a nurse. And they weren't vegetarian or vegan at the time. They've only relatively recently gone so. Um, so I loved animals, I just didn't want to harm them. Simple reaction. Um, I went through my childhood fairly normally. You might say, well, it's kind of unusual that your mum allowed you to be vegan. Uh, my family were a little bit against it, but my mum has always been very supportive of me. And um, one thing that was very important, probably pivotal as I look back, was uh, my mum at school, very, very good pin. She was a piano teacher before she became a nurse. And one of her teachers um, was a vegan lady back in the 1950s, which was war, was completely unheard of. She actually knew Donald Watson, who started the Vegan Society. My mum had kept in contact with her through the music so she was able to articulate to my mum what I was going through as a child um, in adult terms so to speak. So I trundled along, very sporty kid, always outdoors, not that bright, not that academic um, but always loved being outside with the animals, always loved doing sport. Um, one thing that was a problem to me is in my early teenage years I developed an orthopaedic problem, nothing to do with the fact that I was vegan, it was a gross problem and my knees were suffering very very badly. I had multiple surgeries, I was in and out of hospital an awful lot and it resulted in having my right kneecap removed um, and I remember they said to me you will never walk properly again you will always limp and you forget running because you won't be able to do it now which was a big blow to me um, so um, I picked myself up rehabilitated myself as best I could um, I'd missed a lot of my schooling so I came to London and I um, I was a secretary, which people find it really, really hard to believe. My boss actually found it hard to believe that it had been given me to work as a secretary. But I was a secretary for a while and I took up cycling and I had a relatively successful cycling career. But my heart was always elsewhere. Um, I um, met my partner by accident. I moved in with him by accident. In terms of fact, I was working at an asset management company. I was a temp working for the boss of the company. And... Uh, I was renting some accommodation and I got loads and loads of rescued animals in rented accommodation, which I haven't obviously read the small print of the terms of, of the contract. And one day my landlady came around, she knocked on the door and she said, ooh, what are all these animals doing here? Um, could you please move out? She was actually selling the property. Um, so I had to find somewhere to live and my parents suggested to me, you cannot rent and have all these animals, dogs, cats, chickens, everything, you can't do that. So I have to look to buy somewhere. At this point, I feel rather embarrassed saying to you, because you're they're all lovely young people. Even on a salary of a secretary at that time working in London, you could afford to buy something, you know, a flat or something. And I, I managed to, find, to locate a house with a large garden where I could do my rescue. But the problem is I'd been booted out my rented before I could move into the house. So my boss said to me, oh, we've got a conundrum here, Fiona. Um, where are you going to live? I feel kind of responsible for you. And um, he said, you have to come and live with me. Now, Nigel was lovely, but he was terribly posh. He lived in Wimbledon with his wife, Karina, and their three children. And I said, Nigel, best will in the world. I don't think Karina's going to want me turning up with 46 racing bikes, pit bulls, and, you know, chinchillas and chickens and whatever. He said, good point. Um, where is this house you're buying? Where is this house you're buying? And I said, it's in a village called Onga in Essex. And he said, hang on a minute. Somebody who works here, Martin over there, you know Martin, he lives in Onga. 
And I said, does he? And he marched me literally over to Martin's desk, who was trying to pretend we were working because Nigel was coming. And he said, this is my secretary. Do you know her? And he kind of looked up and said, yes. He said, well, she'll have to come and live with you for a while because I understand you've got a spare room. And I kind of remember turning up one Sunday morning at Martin's bungalow in Ongar with my bikes and all my menagerie. And I kind of never moved out because it turned out that he'd moved out of where he was living with his parents because he wanted to go vegetarian. So that was immediate click into the fridge, every, you're now vegan, Martin. You're not with the fridge, you can just leapfrog over that, you're now vegan. So that's how it came. And from that point, we started to do more rescue um, in terms of the fact that we were putting horses at livery yards, farms. I'm not kind of a failure with how much you know about kind of the dynamics of animals and rescue, uh, but we could, you, you, you know, you, could, you can rent yards, you can rent places for horses to go. So we were kind of rescuing horses with the little menagerie that we've got. I was continuing to work in London. And Martin was, we were basically using all our salary to pay for the accommodation for the animals. And then one day, to cut a long story short, I cycled home from work and I went to see the horses on the way home. I called, seven of them came and one didn't. And it was a rehabilitated racehorse that I'd been working with for a couple of years called Oscar. And I found him impaled on a fence, literally. He'd, the farmer, in his infinite wisdom, whilst we'd been at work earning the money to give him, he'd been allowing people to go into the horse's field and shoot. Oscar had got scared. He'd He'd run, he'd bolted, and he'd run into a fence and impaled himself. We nearly lost Oscar. He was at the vet for 13 weeks. He'd never seen an injury like it. And at that point, we sat down and we said, we can't go on like this. We've got to do something different. We can't work this model. We were paying about £800 a week for the animals to, to be at dotted farms, dotted, and they weren't being looking after responsibly the way we wanted to. Um, it was completely, at that point, prohibitive, we thought, for us to buy somewhere with land. That was, the, that was the goal, to get somewhere with land. We didn't look to buy a sanctuary. We looked at somewhere that would provide sanctuary for the animals we'd already rescued. We were kind of looking at properties way, way, way above our league. It's embarrassing to say to you people now that we, Martin's bungalow, detached bungalow, was valued at £86,000. And to get an equestrian property somewhere with some land was moving up to 226. So it's a massive chasm of a gap. Um, but when I told my mom, she knew what had happened. To it. It'd always been my dream to have a rescue. Um, literally, my family went into kind of uber overdrive. I, I jokingly say that I think at one point, my mother had more mortgages than Santander. She really did. I mean, uh, literally, when there was any kind of glimmer of hope that we could afford anything, she sold everything. She sold her piano, she sold her engagement ring, she practically sold her soul. All my elderly relatives, I remember I had a, a great aunt of 98 years old called my Auntie Nancy, who when she actually knew what was going on, she, she shuffled over to her bed, she put her hand under, she got a sock under there with a thousand pounds in for a funeral, give it to Fiona and put it towards getting somewhere. So that's when we actually did manage to get what is now Tower Hill Stables Animal Sanctuary. That's like a quarter of a decade ago. God knows, goodness only knows where that time's gone. And at that point, the decision was Martin would carry on doing the job, you know, the working that he worked at Bank of New York Mellon, and I would care for the animals at home. That was going to be it. And we, we, we just wanted to look after our own animals on our terms. But I am, I'm not really competitive in terms of I challenge myself against other people. I just challenge myself against myself. So it lasted about six months, this idea of me just staying at home and caring for animals and being the good little kind of housewife kind of figure. And um, I thought, well, you know, I really want to do more than this. Um, I thought, I thought, well, what can I do? And um, I thought, hmm, I'm not really the brain of Britain. Um, I want to rescue animals and they keep coming thick and fast to the sanctuary and I'm filling up as quick as I can, like, you know, cope with. But I want to promote what I believe in. I really passionately believe in a vegan lifestyle, an ethical vegan lifestyle. And people do say to me, what's the difference between plant-based and vegan? And for me, the difference is... I do it for others. Veganism means you do it for others. Plant-based is pretty much you do it for yourself. I've never really done anything for myself. I didn't sit down at six years old and think, hmm, in, in four decades' time, I'd probably be healthier if I lived plant-based. It's not like that. I just, I don't care if I live on beans and potatoes for the rest of my life, as long as I'm not hurting anything else or anyone else to do what I need to do. So I, um, I kind of thought, this is probably now we've moved on to apparently the early noughties, and I thought to myself, 
okay, I'm, I was pretty good at sport. What do I, what, what can I, what can, how can I deliver this kind of goal of promoting veganism? Because actually just keep rescuing animals. I mean, I could rescue four animals by that point. I think we've got about well, I don't know, 200. Um, I could rescue 4,000 animals, but I'm not getting to the cause of why they need rescue. I'm just always addressing the symptoms. I thought, I really want to promote veganism. And standing here today in this kind of technological maelstrom, I feel embarrassed to say that. I don't know if people actually remember a time before social media. It's like, whoa, are we going back to Kenzie here? You know, but it is. It really, there really was no way of getting your message out there than kind of using mainstream media. And I remember going out to, I went out to Hollywood last year and I was doing this podcast with a guy called Nimai Delgado. And he was in my bedroom getting ready for this podcast and there was all sorts of things he was whipping out of his bag, cameras and microphones and videos and goodness knows what. And I just stopped and said to him, Nimai, what would you do to get your message out if you didn't have any of that? And he looked at me as if I was talking double dutch and said, do you know what? I really don't know. I don't know. I don't. Well, put yourself in that position. I was in that position back in the early days. Well, what can I do? And um, at the time, the only sport in the UK that was getting any attention really at all, especially women's sport, was marathon running because Paula Radcliffe was breaking world records. And it was a name that we could associate with in the UK. British woman breaks marathon world record, amazing. And the kind of the logic behind what started my running was, I, there's a platform already there. If I could kind of jump onto it, if I could complete a marathon, if I could compete in a marathon, then kind of I can prove that you can do anything on a vegan diet. And I will say now that a lot of people don't realize that until 1984, that was the very first marathon in the Olympics that women were allowed to run in. It was considered too tough a sport for women to compete in, just a marathon. So before that, you, you can get in a few of the major city races, but not long before that, you just weren't allowed to run. Um, so. 17 years on from that, it was a pretty big challenge. Now every city has got a marathon, every town's got a marathon, and everybody knows someone who's done one. But at that point, it was a little bit more exclusive. So I kind of thought, OK, if I can just run one, get round one, hop round one, whatever. Oh, hang on a minute, though. I was told I wouldn't be able to run when I was, when I was a teenager. I thought, well, I was told that. But, you know, I get about, you know, I can kind of jog, I can, I can do bits and pieces, you know, I can give it a go, couldn't I? And that's where it came from. It was literally, Paula Radcliffe's got a lot of success with running, I better get good at marathon running. You literally, you couldn't, you couldn't Google, oh, I shouldn't say that, you couldn't like Google, um, you know, how to run a sub three marathon, you couldn't do any of that. You literally had to try by trial and error. I started doing a few short distance races, um, and I quickly realised that this was going to be a bit harder than I thought. So I went to look for a coach. And, you know, nobody would touch me as a coach because they were saying, look, you've got a bit of ability-ish, but what you're going to do is you're going to go off and you're going to stick to this weird diet and you're going to undo any good that we've invested in you. So we're really not interested. And that's probably about 17 years ago, because the rise of veganism has been completely disproportionate over the years that I've been vegan. And I will just go back and say to you that when I was hospitalized in my teenage years, um, my veganism was so alien to medical professions that I was uh, deemed to have an eating disorder purely because I was vegan. And my mum was actually accused of child abuse because she was allowing me to be vegan. So that's how bad it was. And funny enough, I do get people from around the world today that still write to me with stories like that, you know, teenagers that write and say, how do we tackle this? So I think role models are quite important because it's really hard for me to stand and talk to people because I don't, I think, well, who's going to be interested in me? But if, if I can be of any help to anyone, that's basically why I get out there and do it. So. Anyway, back to my marathon running, I decided then, um, OK, I'm going to have to learn how to do this by trial and error. And it's been an awful big trial and there's been an awful lot of errors. And I don't quite know how I've done what I've done, to be honest with you. Sometimes I look back, I've never really thought about what I'm doing. I've never planned it. It's just kind of happened and I've grabbed every opportunity. And people, people come, sometimes write to me, how do you get a sanctuary? just grab an opportunity if one arises because there isn't like, oh yes, that's the leaflet number 37, how to get a sanctuary. There's nothing like that. You just have to kind of be creative if you like. So I was just being creative in terms of using marathon running. Um, so 
I'm not going to bore people. I don't know how, people, how interested people are in running here. I'm not particularly interested in running. In fact, I've always said to people, I won't say I don't like running. I, I enjoy the fact that I can kind of run, I kind of hop kind of thing. But, and I remember when Keegan actually made the film Running For Good, I kind of avoided watching it like the play. He kept sending, this was another draft, have a look at this cut, and I never looked at it. And he invited me over to Hollywood to actually his premiere with Rich Roll. And um, Rich came over to me, and he's a big kind of, you know, YouTuber, iPod or whatever, he's a pod podcaster. And he came over to me in the cinema, and he said, oh, Fiona, congratulations, great honour to meet you. Oh, the movie's great, what do you think to it? And I kind of said, I don't know, I haven't seen it. And he said, You've <laughs> I, who wants to watch yourself on a giant screen? I avoid sort of brief glimpses in the mirror at home, so I'm not going to want to sit in a cinema and watch myself, am I? And I'd plan the old trick of going to the back of the cinema and kind of, you know, as the, as the screen credits rolled at the start, kind of drop something, and then an hour later when it's over, emerge and say, oh, I found it. Oh, damn, I've missed the film. But he kind of dragged me to the front and made me watch it, and I'm kind of peeping out like this. So it's not a big thing for me to want to actually watch myself on a big on the big screen at all. Um, so anyway, with, so for me, marathon running is a gift that I can use for the animals, but it's not something that I particularly would want to be doing, if you get my drift. Um, it's nice to be out on a beautiful day, but I do train very hard, and it, it kind of clicked with me. To get good at marathon running, I think it's going to be quite a lot of effort. Is it worth it in terms of... I've got a lot of animals to look after. My time is precious to them. If I don't think I can kind of get something back for the animals and for what I'm doing, I'll, I'll leave it alone and go and do something else. And I thought, well, actually, when you win a race or do well in a race, people say to you, what do you do? What do you do for a living? I don't do it for a living. And that's what I will say. We take nothing out of the sanctuary. When anybody donates a penny piece to me, it goes to where it is intended to go. And that is for the animals. Um, I earn my pittance of a living uh, because another little string to my bow is that I'm, I'm a firefighter. I don't me mention that an awful lot. But when I was out running once, people said, uh, a guy um, came up next to me and he said, oh, you, you look really relatively fit and I'm thinking me me I'm running along and he said have you ever thought of joining the fire brigade and I can't say that every morning I did wake up and think today list of things to do join the fire brigade was on them but he explained to me that there was a retained fire service nearby and I could be part of it and it would be bringing extra funds for the animals and I could work it around the unsocial hours I work with the sanctuary and that Martin could fill in for me when I was getting called away on bank holidays and like weekends and evenings so seemed like a good idea also it was a good idea to introduce to another group of people who probably at the time they didn't expect to see a woman firefighter let alone a vegan woman firefighter so you could subtly introduce in a non-aggressive way your veganism to an audience that wouldn't necessarily appreciate or accept it in, in other circles so that was joining the fire brigade I did have a tough time when I actually went to my induction course with the fire brigade uh, because we were rolling out hoses and it was a terribly terribly hot day and um, the ladies in the cafeteria brought out a tray of tea and it had got milk in it and um, I refused and asked for a glass of water and very, very polite, didn't make a big emphasis on the fact that I was vegan. And the sub officer came to me and said, just drink the tea and then you can have some water later. And then it kind of got to a bit of a, a standoff. And um, I, I remember saying to him, I can't, I'm vegan. And he pushed his face into mine and said, vegan, the last one of those we had here lasted three hours, but that was a man. And I said, well, check this vegan woman, because she's staying. And that's when I joined the fire brigade. So, so I, I do that for a little bit. I do that for income for the sanctuary. Uh, back to the running, I thought to myself, OK, a marathon is obviously not two half marathons put together. Um, there's going to be a lot of invested work in here. Is it worth it? And I thought, well, yes, you get free publicity advertising for the sanctuary, because I can mention that. I don't do it for a living, but I can mention the sanctuary if you do well, and if you're interviewed. And also, it can promote veganism. You might say, Originally, I hadn't thought of the, the way I was going to do it. I was just going to tell people, I've run a marathon and I'm vegan and I'm really fit. But when I was starting to get really, really good results, at that time, we were running, uh, a guy, another guy and I called Peter Simpson, were running for Vegetarian Cycling and Athletics Club. And if you are into the intricacies of running, you'll know that to get on certain starts, you've got to be a member of a UK athletics affiliated club. And we suddenly clicked in 2004 Crikey, you've qualified for Championship London. So you're going to be going on 45 minutes ahead of the main race and the men. 
It's a free advertising opportunity for whatever you've got written on your chest. Let's make sure that you've got vegan written on your chest. Um, you have to, I mean, for the, I don't know if you ever have done this race, at, say, say at London, but they come round and they measure the lettering on your club closing with a piece of perspex. And if it's a millimetre too big, they'll say you've got to take that off or run in a blank vest. So we had to affiliate a club and we decided that at that point, back in 2004, we would affiliate vegan runners as a running club. At that time, I was pretty much the only vegan in the village in terms of running. It was like, there was me doing the, the legwork in terms of running and Peter did the legwork in terms of affiliating the club. Um, but now I, I always say it's probably one of the best forms of accidental activism there's ever been because you can't argue with it. And now the Vegan Runners, I think it's about the second biggest club in the UK. Uh, everywhere you go, no matter where you are in the world, somebody will know a vegan runner or be a vegan runner. It's massive. And whereas when I was doing it, there was literally, I'd just be swallowed up if I wasn't at the front on, on the Berlin Marathon with, with the elites. Now, vegan runners mass takeover, not in a nasty way, we don't just go and mob everybody that's not vegan, but you know, we're there proactively supporting, you know, each other and other runners who are interested. So it's a massive form of accidental activism. You just wear vegan across your vest and it's, it's great. People engage and they're kind of interested. So I started vegan runners back in 2004. And from there, it's grown and grown and grown, as has my running. Uh, my running career, career, <laughs> um, has always been a little bit haphazard in terms of the fact I don't really know anything about running. I just know that you get to A to B as fast as you can, and that's, that's all I've ever wanted from it, it, hoping to be the best you can at the event. Um, I only used to do two marathons a year. And this was because of financial constraints and physical constraints. I literally couldn't afford to do more and I couldn't afford the time away from the sanctuary to do any more. Because my days, as Bart said, are pretty hectic. To fit everything in, I run about 100 miles a week. Um, I look after now 550 animals and I'm a retained firefighter as well. It was like I'm sometimes literally getting up before I've gone to bed to fit it all in. In fact, last week I was at Newcastle Vegan Festival and I've got some terrible scarring on my elbow now, on my hip. And um, it was because I wanted to fit the whole day in and I wanted to be able to run and I wanted to be able to go to the festival. I decided one of my midnight runs would be appropriate in Newcastle. And I actually got up really early with a head torch in. I was out with the late night revelers, you know, sort of, and I slipped in somebody's sick and I had a terrible accident crashed to the pavement and some people say you had a bizarre running accident I slipped over in somebody's kind of what they ejected from their body and I, I fell and hurt myself I thought I've been across deserts and never done anything as bad as this um, but so it is hard to fit everything in for me so I'm doing these two marathons a year and it's been really really weird because I train alone I can't run on a track because my knees too bad I can't run bends I have to do all my training on my treadmill and literally once I've done the training, I just forget it till the next day. I run, two, I run three sessions twice a week um, with speed. I run those as double days. I run hill work and I run an over distance run when I'm doing a marathon of about 28 miles on a Sunday. Um, I don't know anything about money, it just works for me. I have a bizarre day. People ask me, oh, what do you eat to fuel that? How do you live? Um, it is well documented. I never lie to people. I will tell the truth. What works for me might not work for you, but it, I, I've, I've sorted it to fit into my regime. Um, I only eat one meal a day. Um, I eat that in the evening when all the jobs are done. And um, I remember, it was actually when I was in Omsk at this marathon, um, I was really proud of this marathon because I did quite well in it, and um, I was mentioned by the IAAF for my, for my appearance there. And um, I was there with the Kenyan and um, Ethiopian athletes, and they laid lunch on for us at the race. And one of the coaches said, um, are you coming for lunch on the Saturday? And I said, mm, no, I don't eat lunch. And he said, oh, yeah, why is that? And I told him I eat this one meal a day. And he said, oh, the warrior diet. And I went, Yes, yes, the warrior diet. That's what I do, the warrior diet. Yes, that's it. Yes, that's what we call. I never thought of that. He said, a lot of the Kenyans do that. They, they find that it works well for them to utilise food only once a day. Now it's been called, somebody else could said, oh, you're the, the supreme example of intermittent fasting. So it's like, yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, I'm really innovative with all this going on. I thought of all that. But no, it just works for me to do, to do it this way around. I don't, uh, people are like, what do you... Um, 
have on the morning of a race. If it's a marathon, I don't have anything. I just eat the night before and I don't eat that much the night before. I've never had any coaching. As you probably guess, I've never had any coaching because they probably say, no, 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 you can't be that. do it like this. But I've never had a coach. So I've kind of worked out what works for me. And my marathon running has been a small gains, lots and lots of little gains to make one big gain. So um, I focus on things that probably others don't think about. So a lot of people uh, stress over nutrition and what goes in. I'll be kind of timing it as to what comes out as well, because if you're on a marathon, when you get to a race, a marathon, you can't gain that much in a marathon. You can you lose an awful lot. So you can be as fit as a fiddle and ready to roll. But if you get stomach cramps, it's going to impede your running performance. So I've kind of always managed my, my body, what I can manage, what is in my control. I've managed very, very carefully. So I, um, I would literally train alone on the Dendra Peninsula. I'd be looking for, I'd be running around the house looking for anything, anything that looked like a pair of socks or anything that was, was a sock to actually put on and go out and train, come back and look after the animals. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'd be on a plane and I'd be greeted by Jos Hermans, Highland Gabrisnas' manager at the airport, ferried to an elite hotel, given my elite number and told to toddle off with the best in the world and thinking, what am I doing here? And if I could tell you how many technical meetings I've sat in with my mum at the back, like a pair of naughty children, sort of playing noughts and crosses and thinking as they talk about where they're going to make their push at 30K, and I'm thinking, somebody's going to have to push me at 30K if I'm not careful. That's the only pushing that's going to be done. Um, it's kind of bizarre. It really is. And one year I turned up at Amsterdam Marathon, and uh, I was so excited to be on the Elite Star. I was just so excited in the Elite Hotel. And my hero, Gabriel Slassy, was walking around, milling around there. And um, I went to get my, my crowning glory was going to go and get my race number. And um, I walked into the little office that they got for Elite. And I said, you know, he said, yes, can I help you? And I said, oh, I've come, I come for my race number. And he said, oh, sign-ons at the Olympic Stadium. And I thought, oh no, I've made a terrible mistake, haven't I? I've come here thinking I'm a good runner and I've been given a, and I've got to go to the Olympic Stadium and I'm kind of backing away. And I said, I've got, I've got this email that said to come here. And he looked at me and he said, you're, you are on the elite start. I'm trying to kind of look a bit more like a marathon runner. And um, I said, yes, trying to have a sideways view of me. Yes, I am on the elite start. And he said, you know, OK, on, on basis of what you run, you might be able to get top 15, top 12. And actually came eights overall in that race, which was a big, I mean, that's a big marathon to do that. Um, so it's been a bit hit and miss. My, I've got a personal best in a marathon of two hours 38, uh, which for me is, is pretty good because I, when actually Keegan showed me the... I never look at myself, ever, ever, ever do I look at myself. It's too horrible. And um, Keegan, I actually did look at me running and I thought, look, calm yourself down I'm sitting with Rich Roll in the cinema back in LA. It can't be that bad. You've got all the fancy gear on. You're in the Marathon de Sable. Look at the backdrop. You've got, you've got to look half decent, haven't you, Fiona? And I was like, yes, of course, calm down. And I'm squinting and I'm looking at this film and I'm seeing this little... Quasimodo figure limping out of the desert. And I thought, no, I don't look good, do I? And I do limp when I run. So for me, that was about the maximum I could ever get in my running career, 238. So I thought, OK, um, I've got the vegan runner vest on. A lot of people are attracting interest for what I'm doing. But actually, this is really hard work to keep doing this. Literally, I don't know if ever any of you have trained for a marathon really, really hard, but you don't wake up, in, or at least I never woke up in the morning and I thought to myself, it's Tuesday. You kind of wake up and think, what is it today? Oh, yeah, it's 10, 800 metre pushes in the morning and a 12-mile recovery run in the evening. It was, like, so horrible. And you were damned, I'm a damned if you do, damned if you don't runner, in terms of the fact that you dread going, but at least you know if you do go out running, then when you get back, it'll be over and the damning will be finished for a few hours. But if you don't go, you just feel guilty anyway. So you're kind of pushed into doing it. Um, so it's really, really hard. And even though I'm getting, you know, um, a certain amount of publicity for the sanctuary and there's a certain amount of interest for veganism, it's not really generating what I want um, in t for, for the amount of effort I'm putting in. So I then decided, OK, um, I'm going to change tack. I can't win the London Marathon. I've got top 20s in two world's major marathons, but, uh, Mar London and Berlin. It's about as much as I can do. And it's kind of, I, I explained to the guy from... Um, Athletics Weekly yesterday, he was talking about it. And I think it's a really, really bizarre place to be in running because you kind of come over the finish line, say, in London, and there's no one around. And you kind of think, well, what do I do now? Well, I better get my bag and go home. There's nothing there. So you're not good enough to be good. 
and you're a bit better than the rest. That's the kind of place I've always been. So I thought, OK, I'll take my vegan message around the world and try and win marathons, break course records and, you know, smaller tier races. And I did that for a while and I thought, OK, shall I retire from running? And um, then, and I'm always hesitant to say one of my friends, because people kind of think, if your friends are suggesting you do these things, what do your enemies tell you to do? Um, he said to me, look, you've done fast ones, you've done flat, you've done all that, you've won races, why don't you do the marathon the Sable? Oh, that sounds good. What's that? He thinks to myself. And he's telling me it's, it's his toughest foot race on the planet. It's, you know, across the Sahara Desert. You know, oh, I'm really geared up for this in 2011 when he first mooted to me. Yeah, let's get an entry. Let's go for it. Um, I hadn't really looked into what it entailed. Other than you got, but basically the entire extent of my knowledge was get a pair of shoes a size too big because your feet will swell when you get there and you need to have Velcro attached to them to stop the sand getting in. That's about as much as I knew. I didn't really think too much about it. It was really, really tough to um, source all my equipment as a vegan because um, at that time, there wasn't the synthetic replacements with sleeping bags. And so I, I remember turning up in my tent on the first year and uh, all the guys, you know, really excited and getting out those itsy bitsy little sleeping bags that are about this big, weigh about an ounce and go to about minus 10 rating. I've got like this huge backpack. I mean, I've got a 30 litre pack going on here. Even when I took it to be weighed, they're like going, oh, it's big, how big are you? Your pack's bigger than you kind of thing, you know? Um, and I've got this massive sleeping bag that I've got army surplus because it's the only synthetic one I could find. It weighed over a kilo. What the heck have you got that for? Oh, it's the only synthetic one I could find, you know? So I had to cart all this gear around Maris and the Sable. The biggest challenge for me before I did the race the first time in 2012 was, I'm alone at the sanctuary and I'm looking after all these animals. And one of our horses, Charity, she's a 42-year-old thoroughbred. She became cast, she couldn't get up and you've got to get her up very, very, very quickly. So I challenged myself, I put ropes around myself and dragged her to her feet. But in doing so, she stepped backwards onto my right foot and she fractured two of my toes. So now I'm left going out to the Marathon de Sable the toughest foot race on the planet with a huge backpack of synthetic products and I've got two fractured toes and people are like, what the hell did you go for? And honestly, as a runner, I mean, I did think about not going and I, I kind of, at the point my foot had swollen so badly, I could hardly cram it into the shoes before I went. But I thought, hey, I'm, I'm 238 marathon runner, I, I can handle this, it's not too bad, I mean, it can't be that hard, can it? So I, I decided I would go because not going, I wouldn't have a definitive answer. Could I complete Marathon de Sable? I was going to be the first vegan woman to do this race. So it meant a lot. It had been going around the world. Vegan woman tackles toughest foot race on the planet. I didn't want to let anybody down, least of all the animals. So I didn't tell anybody about my close friends, my family, my doctor. And I decided to go off and see if I could do it. It was absolutely brutal. People say, what, what, do you, what did you use nutritionally? Um, a bag of boiled sweets and a bag of painkillers was all I could keep in me for the whole week. And by the, the format of the race is, it's in the Sahara Desert. At that time, they carted you into the middle of the desert in army trucks. They expelled you from the army trucks. You trudged over to these tents. You walk over and you poke your head in. Hello, any room in this tent? Any room in this tent? And you find somewhere that you think you can stay for a week. You run each stage, it's roughly a marathon a day. Some days are shorter and there's a long stage which ranges from about 80 odd K to 100 K when they are really feeling generous, they slip in 100 K. And um, you just basically have everything in the pack that you've got for the week, you carry it. If you haven't got it, you can't get it unless someone's kind enough to give it to you. And you struggle on through like 50 odd degree heat, huge big sand dunes, all sorts of apocalyptic weather conditions going on. You fixate terribly on checkpoints and you think to yourself, oh my God, when's the next checkpoint? When's the next checkpoint? 10K. And then you think, check back, what is at this checkpoint? A bottle of warm water and on your way, girl. And it's the next, you're not a jacuzzi and a massage or anything like that. And when you get to the end of the stage, you just crawl into this pit of, of a space that you've got in this tent various groaning going on from your tents mates and you get up the next day and hope you're able to do it again um, by the long stage um, I was suffering quite badly with the foot I wasn't too bad physically but the foot was very very bad and I remember that I was with some of my um, my tent mates that we'd kind of teamed up to do a long stage together because two guys in my tent were really struggling and um, I, I kind of 
unbound my toes, my last bit of tape that I'd used, and I looked at my right foot and I said to Paul, the guy next to me that, you know, was away, I said, what? What's that on my foot? What do you think that is? It's, it's the bone. The bone was sticking out my little toe. Because obviously your feet swell in the heat and they rub on your shoes and you um, you lose the skin and people do come back from that race and they I've seen people pack up on the last stage and I've seen them have skin grafts on their feet. So I've got the bone sticking out of my little toe. And um, it's not pleasant, that's all I can say. But I, I got through it and I got through it midfield, you know, and I decided, yeah, this is for me. I like it. And I was actually trying to analyze. I know, I know. I, this is where the psycho bit comes in. And um, I, I kind of was analyzing. Somebody said to me, why do you like it? And I think um, the races are very hard, and I do like to challenge myself. I'm not kind of academically brilliant, but I'm physically quite strong. And that's where my bent lies. But actually, in the races, you have everything, yet you have nothing. And the things that matter in Civvy Street just don't matter out there. I've seen grown men, I've seen paratroopers sitting on the side of the road, crying, literally begging, as if you go past, for painkillers. And I have seen, um, you, you just feel free. You, you, the freedom is everything. There's no mobile phone technology, you're not contactable. All you have to think of is getting from here to hear and being able to do it again the next day. And if you are able to look up and look where you are, these races are held in the most incredible places. I've been to like every desert under the sun doing them, the four deserts and whatever. They are amazing races to do. But it's the freedom of walking away from modern day life and just concentrating on what is very, very important. It resonates with me because it actually, um, obviously you get home and you turn on the tap and this miracle happens. Water comes out and you can drink it. Whoa, you don't go and say, is it Perrier or sparkling? Or is it fruit flavored? You go, it's water, I can drink it, give it here. You know, it's like that, it brings it home to you. Um, it's very, very humbling. And I always feel a little bit wary of saying to people, um, it's hard because at the end of the day, you can put your hand up and go, actually, I want to go home now, or I want to go back to the hotel in Wazazat and you know, have the five clubs. You can do that. But for an achiever, you don't want to fail. Failure is not an option. So you want to achieve your goals. But it actually makes you think, what would it be like if this was all I had in life? What would it be like? Some people, they don't have even this. So it brings you back that reality check. And as a, a vegan, I think to myself, freedom to do this water, food and shelter, we aren't that much different to the animals and it constantly reminds me of that. Um, so anyway, I decided that um, it was for me. I enjoyed it. I wanted to go back the next year uh, because I'd actually rescued a lady on the, um, on the first stage. She was really, really suffering. She ended up packing up. Uh, the race said, if you want to come back, we'll give you a place. Um, because of your unique um, gesture of compassion over competition. And I thought, yeah, next year, I'm going to go back to MDS 2013. I'm going to hit it hard without broken toes. But this is where I go about what strange friends I have. Um, another friend of mine called Paul, who I'd done MDS with, he said, you've done MDS. You've got the medal. You've, you've done it. That's what people want, the medal. Go and do the polar marathons. Do the North Pole marathon. That's going to prove the point. And kind of little Miss Simple here thought to myself, well, actually, I want to prove that a vegan can do anything. So when you're outside and it's really cold, people come in and say, ooh, it's like the North Pole out there. And if they're tired, they say, ooh, I feel like I've run a marathon. So if you can put the two together, you can go to the North Pole and run a marathon. That's got to prove that you can do anything as a vegan athlete, surely to goodness. So um, I looked into doing the North Pole Marathon, didn't know anything about it. Uh, but as soon as I realised the cost of it, I thought, whoa, not for me, take a rain check there, go back to MDS. But it was a bizarre thing that um, about Christmas Eve time that year, 2012, the race organiser of the North Pole wrote to me and said, if you will do my race next year, I'll give you a place. And I thought, right, when is this directly in the middle of MDS? So I can't do both, but I'm not going to turn down the opportunity of doing that. Didn't know if I'd be able to do it because my knee is a chronic condition. I dislocate it very easily. In fact, I even got doctors writing to me today and saying it cringes. I cringe to think of you trying to run with that injury. It is hard for me. It's painful. But I decided to go and give it a try. And um, I went out there and I won it. And I broke the course record, and I, I beat the men, and, I, and people were saying, 
gosh, you're really good at this. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, I, I didn't think I could do it. I, you know, I mean, it, to me, it was just like maintaining a marathon pace and, and doing what I can do. Um, but some of the guys there said, you should do the world record. You should go off to every continent, run a marathon. You're in the Antarctic race in November. All you need to do is go to every continent. This is when you're all buoyed up after you've got your trophy and that. You're in long year, but then you've won your race. Um, you can go off and you can, you can do a marathon every continent, and then you'll have a world record. And you're, yeah, I can do that, I can do that. And then you get back into the world of reality and you start looking, how can I do that? Like, unless I kind of swim to Australia, I'm not gonna be able to afford to do it, am I? So I put it on a back burner and I, I kept thinking, you know, but hang on a minute, a world record for the animals, for veganism, that's got to be worth doing. That's got to be worth having, surely. And at the time, um, we didn't have the money. We don't have any money of our own to spend on any of our races or anything. So um, it was my mum and dad who stepped in again and said, if you really think this is gonna help, if you really need to do this, we'll remortgage our cottage because it's all we've got left now. So they were gonna go ahead and remortgage the cottage, cottage for me to do it. But uh, they didn't really have time. So um, somebody did step in and sponsor me and I thought, yeah, it's game on. I'll just go off and I'll run a marathon. It's gonna be great. The problem was, that these marathons are kind of really hard to accredit and Guinness are really funny about what they will give awards to. So they were saying, you know, these strict high criteria is you will have a person running with you and you will take photographs at every mile marker. And I'm thinking, I can't do that. I'm going on my own. Percy can't use a camera. And he was coming with me. Um, so I thought, I'm going to have to do something here. The only thing I could think of was to win or place in every race. And then the race would kind of accredit it for you because they kind of go next to you with the car and say, yes, she surely did run it or win it because we've just given her the prize. So I was now challenged with, in this very short period of time, going off to every continent and winning or placing in a marathon, coming home and going back the next week to another continent and doing it all over again. And um, it was tough. It was a tough challenge, but, um, and we had some real, real bizarre moments. I went to Australia and um, I was going through the customs in Adelaide and the customs official came over to me and said, can I help you? Looking for your bags. I said, no, I haven't got any. Oh, that's fine. You, you're just transiting or something. No, 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 nothing. He said, well, what are you doing? And he was looking at me quite more suspiciously. And I said, look at the exit. Exit, get out. I need to get out. He said, you've come on the flight from Dubai, yes. And I said, oh, I said, I know what you're thinking. I said, I've no bags. I'm only here for the day. And he actually said to me, are you flying on to New Zealand? I said, no, I'm going home tomorrow. And he said, uh, you, you basically, you come from the UK on a day trip to Australia. And I'm kind of thinking, oh, this doesn't look good, does it? I can see what's going on. And I said, um, well, yes, yes and no. Um, I, am, I am running a marathon in the morning. And he kind of looked at me and said, you're crazy. But I, anyway, I did it. I, 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 and even the fact that I, did, I never got jet lag in any of it. I don't think I got time to get jet lag. I was like out and back, out and back. I was going every week. And then as soon as I got home, Martin was looking after the animals and I was going off again and doing other things. So um, the long and short of it is I broke not only the record for being the fastest woman in time, days, you know, to go and do this. I was the actual fastest woman to run a marathon every continent in running time because I had to run them all relatively quickly to, to do what I needed to do for the accreditation. Um, and so that's pretty much been, I say my proudest moment. It's not, I mean, I, I'm not really proud of anything I've done. I'm not proud of the reason that's driven me out there to do it because I only do it because animals are suffering and I wish they weren't suffering and then I wasn't out there ru running or running a sanctuary. That's what I would ideally like. In, that's my goal. That's my dream. That's my aim. Um, I have done other things. I mean, I've, I've done kind of all sorts of things with my running. I've done seven marathons on seven continents on seven consecutive days, dressed as a cow. That was just a little add-on that I do. Um, but for me, running is always secondary to the animal sanctuary. So to tell you a little bit about the animal sanctuary, uh, currently we care for 550 rescued animals. They're either abused, neglected, discarded, and wanted. Even on the train coming up here, I got a telephone call and it's the police. And I thought, Percy, what have you been up to? And it was a police officer and he said, you know, I, we are desperate. We have rounded up an enormous amount of horses, ponies. We are going to have to put them to sleep. Um, would you be able to help the stallions, as youngsters, as all sorts, begging me, literally. We don't want to put these healthy animals to sleep. We've got to, you know. And um, so next, I'm then busy on the train arranging a castration for a stallion next Wednesday. Uh, we've got 102 horses at the minute. We've got 45 cows, I've got 150 pigs, I've got uh, 86 sheep, we've got dogs, we've got cats, we've got chickens, various birds, we've got goats, we've got all sorts going on at the sanctuary. And that's first and foremost what I do. I care for them whilst 
looking after the whole project management of actually just not just caring for them physically, but actually arranging to have everything in place so I can care for them. I've got to fundraise, I've got to do all that. It's a really, really big, tough, tough challenge. The running is always secondary to that. Um, it's not something I'm particularly interested in. Um, I don't feel and I, I don't feel particularly proud of anything I've done in terms of you're always looking to attain a little bit more. I know I can never run faster than 238. Uh, people say to me, what are you going to do next year? It's either back to Marathon the Sable for the fourth time, because I forgot to mention when Keegan filmed me, I was in pre pretty good shape in 2017 when he filmed me for running for good, but my shoes fell to pieces on that occasion. And I was ready to hit the long stage hard and Keegan came and I was in a good place and he said, are you all right? Are you going to hit this? I said, yeah, I'm all right, but look at the state of my shoes. And it was like they were, I'd bind them up in gaffer tape. I'd run in those shoes, not the, that particular pair, several times before, but they changed the format of the race. Now there's much more climbing, much more rocks, much more hard terrain involved. So I'd gone in a pair of wider, because I suddenly realised, actually, you don't need to buy bigger shoes. I mean, at some point, you're looking like Coco the Clown with these massive shoes. Your feet don't get longer, they swell and get wider. So I wanted wider shoes. And in 2014, um, I went back to Marathon de Sable and I was running really, really well in the race then. I was in fifth place overall. And one of my tent mates, a guy called Mike Julien, he, had, um, he was out there. He probably shouldn't have been out there. He was suffering. Um, he had leukemia and he was on chemotherapy. He did the first day and he was in a bad way. I was taking about four hours to do the stage. He was taking cut off 12 hours. And he came back on the second day in absolute tears and said, there is no way I can get through this race. Even if I can get through tomorrow, which is another marathon or what, near to a marathon, the long stage is going to kill me. I can't do it. And um, I kind of jumped up and said, you need to do it, Mike. I know where you are. I was in this place in 212. If you can do tomorrow and you still want to do the long stage, um, I'll mentor you around if no one else hint, hint, <laughs> will. I thought somebody might couple with him and join him because lots of people were walking and I was obviously running. And um, I arrived home at my tent on the, um, on, after the third stage and I went to bed. I did my little bit of washing and I, I got my food and I went, went to bed and I'd fallen asleep and I heard some clapping at the finish line and I got up because it's, it's, it's kind of tradition that you get up and cheer the slower runners in. And it was Mike coming over the finish line with his head torch on and um, he threw himself into my arms and um, he said, does your offer stand tomorrow? I really want to try and do this. And you can't very well say, well, actually, no, I've changed my mind. I'm in like fourth place and I really want to hit it hard. You can't, not that I would have done anyway. But I said, yeah, and um, it was, I wouldn't, I don't regret what I did for one minute. Um, I mentored him round. He was on chemotherapy, he couldn't carry his pack, he was delirious at points, but he so desperately wanted to do it. Not just for himself, but to inspire others that his disease doesn't have to define you. You know, you can do anything if you really, really want to. And that probably, that probably is one of my proudest running moments, being able to do that and to be able to help someone else. Because I know what it's like to be out there for another reason. And that is very, very important. And what fires me on with my running, it's, I'm really not doing it for myself. Um, so, um, yeah, people say, oh, what are you doing next? Uh, next year, it's either going to be MDS again, where I do it for myself, and I'll probably pick up some weight from stray along the way and end up not doing it for myself, but that's okay. Um, I've got two England representations for the 10K and the half marathon that I've come back to road running. I thought, I better show, I better show people that I can actually run on the road because I haven't done it for so long. And um, I've got another championship entry in the London Marathon, which I'm toying with the idea of running in my cow suit just for that little bit of extra, <laughs> extra je ne sais quoi for the race. Um, but yeah, I mean, my running now, you know, I just look for ways and opportunities to promote in a positive, peaceful and proactive way what I believe in and, you know, and what I'm passionate about. So everything in my life is centered around others. And I think actually, if I've got an edge with my running or with what I do, it's that I do do it for others. I don't really care about myself very much. And as I say, that's, that's the difference when people want to know the difference between uh, veganism and being plant-based. Um, for me, it's about the ethics behind it. And you know, the one strong point, somebody asked me, have you got any strong points with regard to your running or your life? I haven't. The only thing I, I understand is I have no talent. 
and I know very little, but I really want to learn more and I want to work with what I've got. And that's very, very important to me. Um, I, I don't put myself on a pedestal and you get youngsters come to me and say, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's the main thing. Beware false idols, live your own dreams, find your own path, find your own direction. Don't look to others. Anything's possible if you really want and believe. So I guess that that's my message and promoting that um, because a lot of people think that you can buy happiness in and you can't. It comes from within and you spread it outwards. That's my honest and truthful belief. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Very, very inspiring. Uh, I'm not vegan, but I'm very sympathetic and alive. <laughs> and I can be sometimes yeah. a vegan or vegetarian. Uh, so I don't know, people call flexi. Would you have any kind of advice on how to switch or how you go by instinct or I have few friends who are vegan who say sometimes, oh, you can change one type of milk a day, or there are different tips. Would you have any advice or any tips? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, 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 I would obviously encourage people to go vegan because a lot of people who write to me and say about veganism, the only thing that they regret is that they didn't do it earlier, and that's genuine. Um, but listen to your own body. You know, you replace things gradually and do it in a balanced fashion. I mean, for instance, you know, um, a vegan diet can be very unhealthy. You could just eat oranges all day and it'd be vegan, but you wouldn't be very healthy, you know. So do it with balance and listen, learn to listen to your, to your own body. And I think sometimes, I'm always a bit wary what I say now because everybody's so technologically minded. I, I, I went to this half marathon recently and I'm there with my Timex Iron Man. That's, the, that's about the, some extent of what I've got to watch and I can't even set that. It's like an hour ahead. And I, I, some guy came over to me, actually, and um, he said... Are you Fiona Oaks? And I thought, the big time is here. I've been recognised. And he actually then said to me, I saw you warming up and I noticed you were limping. I thought, oh, no, here we go. Um, and I, I thought, you know, I've seen your film. And he was, um, he come from the, he was an 800 metre runner. He'd moved up. And um, he got the old Casio watch on there, you know, like real pair of old timers. And um, I said, you know, a lot of people tend to get fixated on gadgets rather than listening to this very sophisticated gadget that's in there. So, you know, for me, I can tell that, you know, if I'm not having enough carbohydrates, I know what I'm doing with my own body. So listen to yourself and you'll work it out if you want to. But I think, yeah, slow replacing things, experimenting. For me, I don't buy any of the vegan junk foods. It can be inexpensive. You know, if you want to eat ice cream and you're vegan, you're going to pay more than somebody who isn't vegan. I've never had these products. I don't crave them, so I, I don't buy them myself. We have to buy them for Martin. Of course, he has eyes. We're in love with him. Um, but, um, and I don't have the, the junk food meat replacers. I'm not sure how they'd work for somebody who's tasted the alternative and then come to that. I, I kind of recommend people... Why... Uh, Learn to tutor your palate to accept different things and the beauty and the taste of other things, if you know what I mean. But gradually, slowly, and you'll work it out for yourself. That's the best. There's no, no one thing fits all, kind, you know. But, um, yeah, honestly, it's, it, everybody's vegan between meals, so just, like, build up from there, you know? <laughs> um, thanks, Fiona. Um, do you have any particular mottos you follow, not for veganism, but more so for running? Because, obviously, you have such an amazing time. Is there something you mentioned? Failure is not an option. Was one of them? Yeah, failure is not an option. But is there anything else that you kind of yeah, like just be the been... best person you can. Um, always be an, an ambassador, not just for veganism, for humanity. You know, and compassion, compassion for all. I mean, a lot of people say, "Oh, you turn to animals because you don't like people." That's not the case. We we embrace everything and everyone. Be the best you can, the best person you can, the best runner you can, you know, challenge yourself. For me, with my running, it has become a little bit, yeah, failure is not an option. I'm going to die out there rather than give up. That's, that's just the way I conduct myself. But, you know, as I say, just be peaceful always, polite, positive, proactive in what you do. Actions speak louder than words for me. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah that's my, basically my mantra. I think we can all agree, very inspiring talk. Um, we know what Fiona does at four in the morning, uh, up to late in the evening. Thank you so much for joining us, and one round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.